Shorty Craft and Company. Go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to our Monday seminar series that's been going on for I think almost exactly one year now. Um, it is a silver lining of the pandemic that we're all involved in, lack of travel. Um, but uh, yeah, this week we're super excited and happy that Camila Catania is joining us from MIT. Um, Camila, as I think many people know, uh, most recently spent time at Stanford University um, and she got her PhD um, at GFC, GFZ, sorry. Um, and she, yeah, so she's worked on a variety of things related to earthquake nucleation and how earthquakes begin. And that's what she's going to talk to us about today. Camille, I'll just invite you to tell us how you'd like things to work if you're willing to be interrupted along the way or if you'd like to stop, it, just have people ask questions at the end. Um, yeah. Everyone understands that we we kind of have a big block of time. You know, we've traditionally done it that way, and I think it really works out nice. So she's going to talk for like, roughly 60 minutes, let's say, plus or minus, and then um, she's agreed to stay with us and discuss until uh, 6 o'clock in, in Europe and whatever your time zone is. So, Camila, thank you very much for being here, and please take the floor. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to thank uh, Chris and Massimo for organizing this. It's been really fun to join the, the seminar. And uh, oh, yeah, about interrupting, please feel free to ask questions um, in between. And if I don't see the chat, please let me know if there's anything. Um, I'm, I'm happy to keep this very informal. So yeah, the, the work I will present today is a project I've mostly been doing when I was a postdoc uh, at Stanford with Paul Siegel. And um, the topic is how the earthquakes begin. And I will talk about precursory slip and force shocks and rough faults. You may notice the title is slightly different. I decided to use the title of a paper which is about uh, to come out. It's just been accepted um, on this. And so the, the idea is really to try to understand how fault roughness affects the precursory phase of larger earthquakes. So if we when we talk about the precursory phase of, of an earthquake, there are sort of two and member models that have been around for a long time and that have been debated for a long time. And what you can see on the left is a pre-slip model in which foreshocks are assumed to be triggered by um, a seismic slip. And the idea is that you have an a seismic large scale nucleation process, which culminates in the main shock. And as you have this a seismic acceleration uh, foreshocks take place. Um, on the other hand, we have the triggering cascade model on the right in which foreshocks are simply driven by stress changes from previous foreshocks. And there is no underlying a seismic creep. And then eventually one of these foreshocks um, grows into a larger earthquake. And so as I say, this, this debate has been going on for uh, several decades, but even quite recently, um, papers have come out that um, favor one or the other interpretation. So here, for example, we can see the a figure from Kato and co-authors. Uh, this is the foreshock sequence of the Tohoku earthquake. And what they found is this uh, migration of foreshocks towards the eventual main shock hypocenter. Then we have one large foreshock with its own um, aftershock sequence. But in this case, due to the uh, migration of the events uh, in particular, this was interpreted as being indicative of a seismic slip, so the pre-slip model. On the other hand, we have a set of studies by Ellsworth and co-authors who um, have favored the cascade hypothesis. And what they've done basically is they've relocated a number of foreshocks. This is from the um, Ed Smith sequence, and they've done it for um, Hector Mine and I think Ridgecrest as well. And by carefully relocating the events and then estimating their dimension and stress drop, they find that foreshocks tend to happen just outside of the rupture area of the previous events. Of course, we know that uh, static stress changes there are positive and potentially high, so they 
argue that the sequence can very well be explained by a cascade process without need to invoke any precise mixed lib. So by the end of my talk today, I hope to convince you that uh, what we see during an, an foreshock sequence is probably a combination of both processes. Uh, what we will see in these numerical simulations is that we have a significant amount of a size mixed lip um, on a rough fault before a larger earthquake. But at the same time, the foreshocks are not simply driven by this a size mixed lip in a passive way, but there is a feedback. So foreshocks can trigger one another, but they can also enhance the a size mixed lip so that there is really an interplay going on between the two processes and the interplay determines the evolution of the of the foreshock sequence. And um, so foreshocks, foreshocks clearly require some heterogeneity. If you favor the pre-slip model, you need some heterogeneity to explain why you would have seismic events, foreshocks, and a seismic slip essentially on the same region of the fault. And even if you favor the cascade model, you need some mechanism to explain why foreshocks rest um, even though a main shock is about to happen and um, evolve into a larger earthquake in, in its neighborhood, in the neighborhood of the, of the four shocks. And so what you can see in this figure is a typical example of heterogeneity and how we, we often model it on a planar fault. This is frictional heterogeneity. So we have perhaps a velocity strengthening behavior. This may be, uh, for example, due to the presence of a uh, fault gouge. And then uh, we have some velocity weakening asperities that tend to have stick slip behavior. And some study, and this is a very successful model, for example, to explain the behavior of uh, small repeating earthquakes um, on creeping faults. And uh, here are a couple of studies that use a similar setup to understand foreshock sequences. And you can indeed obtain foreshock sequences that seem uh, quite realistic. And in some ways, I, uh, they were quite similar to the ones I will present later. Um, however, one uh, issue with this type of model is that by imposing velocity strengthening friction, you're basically building in pre-slip. You are always going to have some amount of a seismic slip. And so it is not easy to test um, the cascade versus the pre-slip model because of, of how, this is, um, how this is set up. So instead, we look at another source of heterogeneity, which we know is very um, very common, uh, ubiquitous, I would say, which is fault roughness. Now, we know that faults uh, have a complicated geometry. If you look at fault traces at the regional scale, and then again, you find roughness at every scale from the outcrop to um, specimen. And so we know that this is something that basically every fault um, has. And, and that's why we want to include this type of heterogeneity and see how it affects the, the, the nucleation phase. So that's a little summary of the model setup. The model is relatively simple. Uh, we are running 2D plain strain, purely elastic simulations. We're using rate and state friction with the aging law. And um, the default is uh, modeled as a fractile uh, profile. And we use the Hurst exponent of 0 0.7, which is consistent with the number of um, field observations. And for computational reasons here, we are only including uh, roughness wavelengths that are close to, or simil uh, close to or larger than the nucleation length, even though we tested a couple of simulations with a smaller minimum, minimum um, roughness wavelength, and it doesn't change the result um, too much. So the fault is loaded by resolving um, a uniform stressing rate tensor on a fault with a variable orientation. So we have some slight variation in um, the shear stressing rate due to the orientation of the elements. However, we find that um, these small variations of shear stressing rate are really small compared to the stress variation due to slip on the fault itself, which I will explain in quite a bit of detail in the talk. So for the purpose of, of this talk, we can basically assume that the loading is uniform. Uh, so the shear stressing rate is uniform. And um, one note about a simplification in the model, uh, we're not modeling opening, and there may be some locations in which normal stress perturbations are tensile, and we may even have a tensile total stress. And in that case, instead of modeling opening, we set the normal stress 
um, equal to zero, which is um, what is typically done in dynamic rupture simulations. So let's take a look at uh, some seismic cycles uh, modeled on these rough faults. Here we're looking at the maximum slip velocity um, on the fault as a function of time. Earthquakes are defined as events that exceed a certain um, characteristic slip velocity, indicated here by the dotted line. And what you can see is that in, on this rough fault, we have some accelerations that don't reach seismic velocity in the interseismic phase. And then we have uh, this cluster of seismicity late in the cycle. And if we zoom in and uh, on one sequence and plot time on a log scale, to time to dimension, we see that most of these events, actually all of these events, are, um, are four shocks. So we also want to um, compare the behavior of the seismic cycles in a rough fault to a planar case. So here you can see in blue, we're looking at the average slip velocity on a rough fault. And it's basically very similar to what we saw before with the maximum slip velocity. And it's compared to a flat fault. The main difference is that uh, the interseismic slip, velocity are, slip velocities are much higher on a rough fault than they are on a planar fault. You can see it's a difference of few orders of magnitude. So we can understand this better if we look at the figure on the, oh, oh sorry. Camilla, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. In, in the rate state aging law, which, uh, uh, how is uh, assumed that the D sub C or L, the length scale, is uh, heterogeneous or constant? It's constant so far, even though, um, even though there may actually be some special variations. I, I mean, this is a whole other discussion we can have at the end, but once you have a rough fault, you expect processes like wear to not be uniform anymore. And so you would maybe expect some second order effect. And so uh, changing, allowing the, the um, sleep weakening distance this sub to, to vary in space is something that I'm considering for future work uh, because of the effect of roughness in, in the wear process. But at the moment it's uniform and it's uh, 10 to the minus four meters. So that's kind of at the higher end of realistic uh, love values. And therefore, sorry to ask you again, this yeah. fluctuation in the response of the fault system is due to the variation. I think the audio cut off. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> and uh, I, I mean that uh, the this fluctuation in the response of the fault system is mainly due to the variation of the stress history. Uh, normal stress specifically, and I have uh, several slides on that, so okay, <laughs> I, I'm sure you'll, uh, yeah, I will, I will definitely address that. Um, yeah, so we see, and as you say, so because it is due to, due to spatial variations, as we show later, um, these higher interseismic slip velocities are not uniform. You, you can see in this figure on the left. So here we're looking at um, the color indicates slip velocity. So I will use this color scale everywhere. So I will briefly explain it. Anything in blue, it's essentially locked. Uh, green colors are close to typical plate rates. Yellow colors are close to maybe a slow slip events. So fast creep and anything in red, um, dark red is uh, seismic. So what we see in this figure for the flat fault, it's locked and it gradually accelerates. Um, interseismically, very much like you know what what you see in, in spring slider models, uh, you have this this acceleration um, interseismically. But on the rough fault, you have some places that are locked, uh, just like the the planar fault. But in some other places, you have this much higher uh, slip velocities, you know, ten to the minus nine, ten to the minus ten or so. So there is some interseismic uh, creep but it is really very localized. And so we want to understand why this happens and, and, and why it happens where it does, because this is really leading up to the foreshock sequence. And so if you want to understand a seismic slip and stick slip behavior during nucleation, uh, we should also understand what happens kind of leading up to it. So uh, we just briefly go through, um, again, the reasons for, for this behavior. And I will begin with a really simple case of a planar fault. So we're looking at shear stress as a function of time. 
And there's nothing surprising here. You see the shear stress increases at the uniform rate. You can see the velocity also increases the, with the color scale. And once the stress reaches what we can think of as a static strength value, um, then we have a seismic failure. A static strength value here, I mean a steady state coefficient of friction at some reference interseismic slip velocity. And then we have um, an earthquake and the stress goes down to what is now a dynamic strength, which we can is basically a steady state strength uh, in this case for rate and state at a seismic slip velocity. And then the cycle repeats. So nothing, nothing surprising here. And uh, it was also useful for reasons that would become clear later to look at this um, in a space of shear stress versus normal stress. So it's basically the plane on which you would uh, draw, say, a Morse circle. And so here now these two lines represent the uh, static and dynamic strength. And then the normal stress is uniform. And so the cycle is just uh, an increase in shear stress interseismically, and then a decrease in shear stress during the earthquake. Nothing more than that. So if we have um, a rough fault, the main difference, it turns out, that really controls the behavior is the existence of uh, variations, spatial variability in normal stress. And so here I'm showing uh, the topography in, in black. And in blue and in yellow, you can see the normal stress perturbations due to an arbitrary amount of slip um, as calculated uh, from boundary element calculations on inclined elements. And then this analytical result, which I show here. And uh, if we look at the zoomed in version, it is also quite intuitive. You can see that places like this, this location here where the motion of the fault is basically pushing the two sides together. You expect a higher normal stress, uh, more compressive, and in places where the motion of the fault tends to pull the two sides apart, you expect um, a lower normal stress. You have like a negative um, normal stress uh, perturbation. And uh, what we can see from, from this expression is that the normal stress variations, so the amplitude increases with the total amount of slip. And uh, otherwise, it is a function of the fault profile. So y hat is just the elevation in uh, wave number domain. And I'm putting these numeric, these analytical results, uh, not because we're using it in the simulation. In fact, we're not. Uh, in the simulation, we are doing the full boundary element calculations so that we are allowing for changes in normal stress as the amount of slip changes uh, on the fault. Um, but the analytical result may be useful for uh, running simulations on a planar fault and using this as a proxy for roughness. And we did some tests and this seems to work uh, reasonably well. So it may be useful for numerical methods that have trouble dealing with um, the complex geometry. And we can use this as a, as a proxy. So um, yeah, I should also mention that these results are not completely new. Um, it's really only one step uh, built on top of results from Fang and Dunham. Uh, and it's also gen a specific case of the more general results obtained by Chester and Chester. So, you know, in, in, as a summary, the, the distribution of normal stresses on a rough fault is very well known. It has been well um, quantified for a long time. And uh, we know that it has a Gaussian distribution and the amplitude depends on the total slip, as we saw earlier. It depends, uh, as intuitive, on the amplitude of the, um, of the topography, so the, the, the amplitude of the elevation profile, and also um, the minimum wavelength. So now we can think about the cycle uh, accounting for these spatial variations of normal stress. And so now we have this Gaussian distribution uh, centered at the average, the kind of nominal normal stress value. And uh, what I show here is the state of stress of the fault at the very end of, of an earthquake. So this is sort of the really, the velocities may still be seismic and the fault is at a low stress level. But you can see that the actual value depends of the shear stress, depends on the uh, normal stress. And as I said earlier, we are practically loading the fault uh, at a uniform sh shear stressing rate. So we can now think of, 
uh, of the interseismic loading just as a shift in the, on the, along the y-axis. And what you can clearly see is that points that have low normal stress are going to reach failure sooner. It's quite intuitive because the stress drop is smaller for these uh, locations so that for a given uniform um, shear stressing rate, we, ex we expect them to reach failure um, sooner. And um, so now we need to think about what happens when these points with very low normal stress uh, reach failure. And uh, another important effect of normal stress variations is a change in the fault stability. And I think the easiest way to uh, think about that effect is by looking at the um, nucleation dimension. Nucleation dimension has different forms, um, but they all, they're all a function of rate and state parameters. Um, they grow with the slip weakening distance, but what's relevant for us is that they are inversely proportional to the normal stress. So uh, regions where the normal stress is low are the most, re the, the most stable areas uh, on the fault. And the nucleation length there may exceed the size of, um, of the slipping patch itself, so that uh, this is conditionally stable. We don't expect um, seismic acceleration, we don't expect seismicity, instead we expect creep at a constant rate um, with um, and also constant shear stress. And so again, at low velocity, at low normal stresses, we expect stable behavior. And so um, we, uh, we see that we have regions with uh, creep due to the stability, um, of these areas and due to the fact that they, they're just um, reaching failure before the rest of the fault. And then we have regions which are much later in their seismic cycle, further from failure, and we expect them to remain locked. So, and I think this is kind of addressing exactly what uh, Massimo was asking. Um, so if we, if we, we can basically compare this uh, conceptual model with the simulations and we see that that really explains um, the behavior we see. You can see, you can see creep where the normal stresses are low and you can see um, asperities um, where normal stresses are high tend to be locked. Um, I will use the term asperity here as a, basically a synonym for a region wind enhanced compression and, and a small nucleation length. So, yeah, so now we looked at the mostly at what happens early in the cycle when these um, low sigma regions be, begin slipping and they do so in a stable manner. Um, but let's think a little bit about what happens later in the cycle when even the asperities may approach failure. So asperities tend to have a higher, uh, they have a, nor a higher normal stress than the average. And so the nucleation length is smaller than the uh, nominal nucleation length. And so they tend to be unstable and we expect a uh, stick slip behavior. And so that's why we can have uh, four shocks on, on these um, asperities. And so now we can look at what the four shock sequence uh, looks like. So it's the same type of plot I had before, but we're looking at time to the main shock on a log scale. And so we're really mostly looking at what happens on the last um, day or so. And um, you can see as before the creep associated with low sigma and locked asperities, um, high sigma are as I said, locked interseismically, and then they can break in four shocks. And we find that all the earthquakes begin on these um, locked asperities. And, some, and they typically propagate in the surrounding creeping patches, but then they can be arrested by the following um, asperity. And so that's basically the mechanism that allows for simultaneous uh, creep and four shocks is really this spatial variation in fault, fault stability um, due to roughness. So now if we, we can take a look at the first order features uh, of this sequence. So the first feature that, that you see by eye is the temporal clustering. You can see that you have sequences of events. You have four here, three here, and so on. And they are very close in time. So for example, here I'm zooming into one and you see that they are um, a few seconds apart. And um, the nucleation point is always just outside 
of the rupture area of the previous events. So this is very consistent with the observations from um, Ellsworth and Bullard, for example, and it is indeed um, kind of a synon it is indeed due to static stress changes um, between these um, neighboring asperities. So there is some cascade uh, behavior going on, but you can, even if you kind of zoom out and look at the whole picture, you see that there is a lot of creep happening. And in, in, indeed, the amount of moment released by creep uh, exceeds the amount of moment released by, by the foreshock. And so there isn't only a cascade process, but there is also um, a seismic slip. And um, one interesting um, observation is that you see an acceleration in a seismic slip during the aftershock, uh, sorry, the foreshock bursts themselves. I'll just go back very quickly. The first thing you can notice is an overall increase in the creep velocities. So we go from um, green to yellow here. So we have an acceleration in creep. And again, if we zoom in, we see that most of this acceleration takes place during the foreshocks themselves. And uh, it is maybe surprising to see that uh, creeping patches respond to foreshocks even when they are several rupture lengths away. And rupture lengths, I mean the rupture length of the foreshock. And uh, we can get some insight into the reason why we have such a strong response by uh, thinking about the uh, direct effect in um, rate and state friction and so we know that the velocity after um, a step in, in stress, so an increment delta tau due to static stress change from the foreshocks, um, the, the, the slip velocity increases by a factor, which is the expo exponential of uh, delta tau, the change in stress uh, normalized by A sigma. So if sigma is very low, which we know is the case in the regions where creeping is, is taking place, um, then uh, we also expect these regions to be very sensitive to even small stress changes. And that's why foreshocks can be much more effective at accelerating creep than um, you would expect if you, were, if you were not considering the spatial variations in sigma. So now we saw how um, creep responds to foreshocks, but we also saw an interesting behavior uh, when you look at the asperities themselves. So here you can see an asperity which is, an asperity which is locked um, between, since the, the last main shock. And, and then there is a foreshock here. And what you can see is that the slip velocity after the foreshock remains quite high. So you don't have locked foreshock locked, you have locked foreshock creep. Um, the slip velocity is much higher. And you can also see it in this figure. So we're looking at the asperity. It was locked before. We have a foreshock. And now it's slipping uh, several orders of magnitude faster than it was um, before the, the foreshock. And so to understand this, we uh, use the simple spring slider model. So we're now treating one asperity as a spring slider. And uh, it is loaded at a constant um, velocity. So the important result here is the dependence of the minimum velocity, the minimum slip velocity of the spring slider on the loading velocity. So we derive this um, analytical result and you see this minimum velocity, which we can think of as the velocity when the, uh, the severity is locked. It's uh, given by a constant a characteristic dynamic slip velocity, which depends on um, friction, frictional, frictional behavior and, um, and strength. And, but otherwise, it also depends on B over A, which is uniform for us, but then it depends on the loading velocity to the power of B over A. So what that means is that if you load the um, asperity slowly, it will reach a lower velocity than if you load it much faster, which is quite an intuitive result. And so now we can apply this to um, one particular asperity and the loading velocity uh, during most of the interseismic period is basically equivalent to um, a plate velocity and we can estimate it from the, um, from the background loading rate. Um, 
apply it to um, an asperity of a known dimension. But then after the foreshock, we saw that there is this acceleration of creep, especially in the vicinity of the foreshock itself. And so now loading now is, is really dominated by the surrounding creep as opposed to the tectonic loading. And this is several orders of magnitude higher than the background loading rate. So uh, that means that instead of relocking at the previous rate, the asperity now will creep at a higher velocity, which in this case is um, close to say 10 to the minus eight. And, and so this really explains why we have this jump in velocity after the foreshock. And so it is really given once again by the feedback between foreshocks surrounding creep, and then the creep reloads the, uh, the asperity itself. And uh, so we think that this is quite important in controlling the overall acceleration in creep because if the asperity was relocking, it will effectively uh, produce some resistance on the neighboring creep. You can think of a locked asperity as, as projecting a stress shadow around itself and preventing creep from accelerating much because uh, you, that, would that would produce very high uh, slip gradients. But instead, the asperity is now creeping at a higher velocity and this also allows the surrounding creep to continue at a faster rate. And um, maybe a mental image um, for this process is that each foreshock is somewhat unpinning the fault and then allowing the surrounding creep to continue at a higher rate than it would have otherwise. And so just a summary for, um, for this result, um, we find that uh, normal stress perturbations create this distinction between creeping patches and um, asperities and then when asperities break they increase stresses on the creeping patches and uh, they lead uh, them they, they cause them to accelerate and then this faster creep can load um, the asperity itself preventing it from fully relocking but it can also of course load uh, nearby asperities so that we may um, expect um, a, mig a migratory pattern which we will look at later. And so this feedback um, predicts an overall acceleration because it's basically a positive feedback in which you have um, the, all of this contributes to increasing the creep velocity and increasing the rate of foreshocks. And so I would like to uh, spend a few slides describing the temporal behavior and seeing if we can uh, predict what uh, kind of a functional form for the temporal evolution of creep and uh, seismicity. So uh, here is a figure showing um, the temporal behavior of foreshocks. As I say, they, they are all really late in the cycle. If we zoom into the foreshock sequence, we see a burst of earthquakes, a period of quiescence, and then another burst of earthquakes and notice how the average slip velocity increases um, almost in a step-like fashion during this first burst. And then as we keep zooming into the, the last part of the, of the plot, we basically see the, the same pattern. We have some seismic bursts, quiescence in between, and we have this kind of step-wise increase in the average slip velocity. And it is maybe easier to see this if we plot it on a log-log plot. So we're looking at a time to the main shock on a log scale. And you can see that the seismicity rates in red um, are really dominated by the clustering behavior. I should say the seismicity rates here are estimated just as one over uh, inter-event time. But the first thing you notice in this figure is, is that you have a lot of events in a really short time, uh, several times. And so these are these bursts. Um, however, you may also see a, a hint for a one over T acceleration in seismicity rates. And that is even easier to see in this plot because I'm also plotting these average slip velocities in the nucleation regions. And for those, you can see again, this, you have all this very episodic behavior, but then if you step back and look at the Kind of average behavior, these steps give you a um, 1 over t um, acceleration. So um, 
What I also wanted to point out is we really can only see this because we are also looking at the sleep velocity in the nucleation region. And in nature, most of the times, well, maybe always, we, we can't see this directly, uh, but we only see seismicity rates. And in that case, I think it would be hard pressed to see the acceleration if I was only showing you um, the, the red dots. And so a way to see that more uh, clearly is to stack a number of catalogs. And that's because yeah, the data, yeah. yeah. Chris, can, I, can I ask a question about the last slide? Um, yeah. The seismicity rate here, the rate means the number of places on the fault that have achieved uh, what, one centimeter per second? That's what it means? Yeah. Yeah, okay. something along those lines, yeah. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was saying if you, the temporal clustering, uh, it kind of occurs randomly in time. So you, uh, if you are stacking different catalogs, um, you may be able to see the underlying acceleration uh, much more easily. And that's the case here. And here we are basically stacking a number of uh, consecutive um, earthquake cycles and each sequence is aligned so that the main shock is always at time equals zero. And so here you can see this really nice, um, much clearer uh, 1 over t acceleration. And so this is quite consistent with uh, observations. Uh, what's known as the inverse Omori law, which is this 1 over t acceleration um, of four shocks leading up to the main shock has been seen in stacked catalogs. And this is an example from um, Jones and Molnar. And also consistent with the results I showed you, it is really hard to see it if you look at individual sequences because individual sequences tend to be much more kind of burst-like in, in character. And you have aftershock sequences within each um, uh, foreshock sequence. And so it, it is not so clear in that case. And uh, we need to be really careful when we're stacking catalogs. And uh, this is a really interesting study uh, showing how this acceleration can arise um, when you stack catalogs. And so he, this is from Helmstetter and Sarnet. And uh, this figure is simply showing that if you take individual catalogs shown in, in the colors, you don't really see this uh, acceleration towards the end you see aftershock type sequences and some bursts. But then when you stack them, you can see um, the acceleration with um, time to the main shock. And um, in this paper, Hans Netter and co-authors could reproduce exactly the same behavior by stacking ETAS simulations. And so what they, what they demonstrated is that the acceleration can entirely be an artifact due to stacking um, all these sequences and requiring the main shock to be aligned with time equals zero. And in, in an ETAS model, as many of you know, there is no a seismic slip. There is absolutely no underlying physical process which gives you a 1 over t acceleration. Uh, ETAS contains uh, kind of aftershock triggering so that uh, each foreshock has um, an Omori type probability of um, triggering earthquakes um, afterwards. And when you stack them, this can give you this acceleration. But it is really important to understand that it is not physical, like there is no one over T underlying process um, in this case. So it's just useful to remember this when we're looking at uh, stacked catalogs. And it's also in interesting to know that uh, this one over t acceleration can really is, is fully consistent with a cascade model when you're looking at stacked catalogs. On the other hand, in our case, we saw a hint of the acceleration even when we were looking at a single sequence. And most importantly, we know that we have a lot of a seismic slip happening in these simulations. And so even though the cascade model could explain the acceleration in the stacked catalogs, we know that there, may, there must be a additional um, loading from a seismic slip going on just because there is so much uh, creep on the fault. And so what seem, seems like an appealing model then for the 1 over t acceleration is a model of self-acceleration. So in a classical nucleation model, 
um, including those derived by Dietrich and later um, Rubin and Ampuero. So you expect nucleation to happen over a finite length and the slip velocity leading up to instabilities are expected to accelerate as one over t. And so this, uh, according to this um, interpretation, then the one over t acceleration you see in catalogs would be uh, caused by nucleation process in, in a classical sense. And so we thought that this may, uh, may be a, a more uh, suitable model in our case, but then um, if you think about it a bit more carefully, you realize that the, um, the conditions for the self um, acceleration aren't really present on our fault. So these models, the, all these models were developed for uniform frictional properties. And uh, they predict uh, an acceleration towards instability at the end of the cycle. So on a rough fault, we have these creeping patches where I told you the nucleation length is really large. So we expect these to be conditionally stable. They should not accelerate if the loading rate is constant. So we don't expect them to undergo the classical nucleation with the 1 over t acceleration. And then we have asperities which are locked and they are still far from, um, from failure. So even though we do expect them to accelerate towards instability late in their cycle, um, based on the background loading rate, that shouldn't happen as soon as it does when in the simulations that, that we looked at. And so again, uh, we need to think a little bit about the interaction um, between the two. So creep patches are indeed conditionally stable, so they're not going to accelerate on their own. But if the loading rate increases, they can accelerate. And we saw that earlier when we, um, uh, when we looked at the response from each foreshock. And then similarly, the asperities are far from failure, but the additional loading from creep can cause them to fail. And so we think again that the um, interaction between these two modes may be responsible for, um, for the acceleration. And so we want to think about a model which um, is really based on this feedback um, as opposed to a self-acceleration model. So we derived a very simple model that uh, takes the feedback into account. Uh, so I really should emphasize this is simplifying the system very much. So it's more of a proof of concept. Um, but so the assumptions, I think, are quite reasonable. The first assumption is that the seismicity rate is proportional to an average um, velocity in the surrounding region. So we're thinking about um, an average velocity for the creep patches and seismicity rate in, in that region should be proportional to that. And the second assumption is that after each um, earthquake, the slip velocity increases by a constant factor. And that's the, the same result that we saw earlier, uh, which we expect from um, radiant state fault uh, when we impose a constant um, stress, uh, instantaneous stress change. So now we can uh, solve these for um, as a function of time. And this is the solution. So we find that the slip velocities and also the um, seismicity rates, which are proportional, uh, grow with the inverse of time to the main shock. Again, we have the one over T um, acceleration. And um, then we have a constant, which depends on the stress drop of the four shocks. That's intuitive because if four shocks have a higher stress drop, they are going to transfer more stress in the neighboring creeping patches. Um, it also depends on the um, minimum um, length, uh, wavelength of um, roughness and um, as well as the asperity size. And it also depends on this prefactor uh, between that controls the response of the creeping patches. So we want to estimate this prefactor just so that we can uh, put some numbers into this expression and compare it with the simulations. And so we um, did so um, here. 
we are basically assuming um, in this simple um, kind of alternation of um, asperities and creeping patches. And this is quite close to what we see in the simulation. So there is this kind of constant spacing determined by the local uh, roughness uh, characteristics. And so we have asperities and creeping patches. When a foreshock happens, it breaks one asperity and the two nearby creeping patches, which have very low um, strength. And so now if we assume constant stress drop and uniform stress drop uh, in this um, foreshock, then we can calculate exactly what the stress changes are in all the surrounding creeping patches. And then we can use this result um, and estimate the change in slip velocity uh, in average in this region after each foreshock. So uh, the, the details um, aren't that important, but you know, just we, we can estimate this factor beta and, and then we can have a really rough estimate for what we expect the acceleration to look like. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, you can see this dotted line is, oh, sorry. A dotted line shows this analytical result with this um, estimate for um, the response of creep to the to, to the foreshocks, and, um, and we also have this one over t uh, acceleration. And there is some range because the stress drop of the foreshocks isn't uh, constant, so we have some variability. And you can see that uh, to first order, it does explain what we see in the simulations. Um, it is a little bit overestimated, and that is probably because uh, we are not allowing for any variation of creep rate between foreshocks. So we assume that the, the, the creep velocity increases at each foreshock and then it remains constant, whereas um, in, in reality we see that it, it tends to decelerate, which is why we are um, overestimating. But um, overall we do recover the right um, scaling and we predict the 1 over t um, acceleration. So we, um, we basically found um, a 1 over t acceleration in this model based exclusively on the interaction between foreshocks and creep, which uh, we also found, was also found for models of nucleation on the planar fault. So these are the classical um, nucleation models. So it was actually quite surprising that uh, such different physics gives you the same, the same type of behavior. Uh, however, one difference I want to highlight is that in our case, the 1 over t acceleration is an average behavior, but in practice you have sort of a very episodic um, uh, behavior with sudden increases in seismicity rate as well as uh, creep velocities. And so I would like to spend a bit more time now thinking about the differences between these two uh, cases, not only in time, which we saw are, they're actually surprisingly similar, but in space. And so think about what is the length scale over which we expect nucleation in the two cases, and also the location of the pre-slip relative to the, to the main shock. So we're just going back to this uh, figure, and what is very clear is that we have some migration of foreshocks. Again, this can be explained uh, from the feedback between um, foreshocks and, and creep, uh, as well as simply static stress changes. So we have this migration, and the main shock begins at the edge of the creeping region. So we see that they're spatially uh, distinct. And this has been um, called by various, co by, by various other authors um, the migratory nucleation. Migratory nucleation meaning that nucleation happens at one place and then you have this migration and then the main shock begins somewhere else, only to the side of, the, um, of, the, um, of this nucleation. Um, I prefer to call this pre-slip to distinguish it from the nucleation itself. Because I want to highlight that each one of these little earthquakes and then the main shock, they each have a nucleation which happens very much like you would expect from a classical model. And, and it happens over a length scale 
which is close to the local nucleation dimension. And then in addition to that, you have this uh, pre-slip, which, uh, as you can see, it happens over a much more extended area. For reference, the nucleation length, the nominal nucleation length in this fault is about um, 100 meters. And so this pre-slip area, in this case, is about 20 times um, larger. And so now we found these two major differences in um, the traditional classical nucleation and the pre-slip we saw on the rough fault. So on a smooth fault, the length scale of pre-slip is the nominal nucleation length. And um, whereas in our case, the pre-slip can happen over a much, much more extended area uh, than the nucleation length. And to some extent, we expect that because we know that uh, this aseismic slip is happening in places where the nucleation length is uh, larger than the nominal nucleation length. And then there is also um, a geometrical effect in that if you have many creeping patches separated by locked asperities, they will they, they can creep and they will not accelerate as they would have done if they were one contiguous region just because they are smaller and so they will tend to be more stable. So this is really a consequence of uh, roughness. And then again, uh, we found that the um, the classical pre-slip model predicts a kind of no localized nucleation at the main shock hypocenter, whereas we see a migration of seismicity and creep towards the, the hypocenter. And so in the next few slides, I want to go over um, observations that indeed seem to be quite consistent with this model of nucleation on a rough fault um, and, and these migratory patterns. So the, the first evidence um, is given by a number of recent foreshock sequences. So this is what I showed earlier, uh, it's the foreshock sequence of the Tohoku earthquake, which is quite um, reminiscent of, of our simulations. We have this migration and then the main shock begins at the edge of the previous um, seismicity. And this was also seen for Iquique and uh, for L'Aquila earthquake, among others. Uh, the second evidence comes from quite a different setting. Uh, these are observations of pre-slip and fast slip under a glacier uh, in Antarctica. And this is a study from Barczyk, uh, Brodsky and co-authors. And they basically have two GPS stations and they find um, slow precursory slip at one station and then the fast slip beginning at the different at a different station and so they propose this model of kind of a migrating um, um, a seismic slip prior to um, to the main event and so they classify um, slip events based on whether the pre-seismic acceleration is collocated or it's at the other station and they find that migratory nucleation seems to be prevalent um, in this case and then finally, uh, there's some evidence of similar behavior uh, from the lab. Uh, these are simulations on uh, faults which are the order of a couple of meters. So large enough to, to contain um, uh, like an entire nucleation process. And uh, this is a figure from uh, McCluskey and et al, 2019. And so the lines show uh, snapshots of slip. So when the lines are really uh, far apart, it's a seismic event. And these lines close together is precursory slip. And you can see that the event begins to the side of the precursory slip. And again, that's consistent with what we found. And in both of these cases, the authors explain the behavior by appealing to some type of heterogeneity um, on the fault surface and perhaps roughness. And um, the simulations that I showed you are very much consistent with that. So it seems like there is this kind of picture emerging from different places of uh, migratory nucleation and uh, fault roughness seems to be a likely candidate to explain all these different observations. Okay, so I will uh, now conclude uh, again with this cartoon showing the feedback between creep and foreshocks. 
And um, the main conclusions of this work is that uh, we can understand the behavior of the nucleation phase on the rough fault um, as being controlled by heterogeneity in normal stress due to slip. And heterogeneity in normal stress gives rise to heterogeneity in fault stability, nucleation length, and it allows for simultaneous foreshocks and creep. And it favors migratory nucleation, and it seems to allow for uh, accelerating slip on um, a much broader fault region than you would expect uh, simply by considering the nominal nucleation length. And the nucleation process is really controlled by feedback between creep and foreshocks. And so, as I said at the beginning, um, it kind of it gives credit to both the, the pre-slip and the cascade hypothesis in that both processes uh, are taking place. And uh, we find that the feedback can produce a 1 over t acceleration in seismicity rates, which is consistent with uh, what has been seen in stacked catalogs. And uh, thanks for your attention. Um, as I mentioned, this is a paper that was just accepted. So if you want to read more, uh, feel free to check it out. Thanks. Wonderful. Please unmute everyone. And uh, let's thank you. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we use the raise your hand feature? I will keep track of people and let's especially invite scientifically, academically young people to uh, ask questions. I see John Vidali, he, he almost satisfies that criteria. He's young. But anyone else, please, please uh, the PhD students, someone within the first uh, couple of years of their PhD, I will just move you to the top of the line when you raise your hand. John. Okay, well, I'm happy to defer to a young person if that's your preference here. Or if I can throw out, uh, I mean, I guess my question is, what's the ratio of the slip to uh, the foreshocks uh, in terms of moment? And should we just think of this like foreshocks? There's a whole distribution of these pre-slip areas. We don't know which one's going to run away, but the bigger they are, the more likely they are to be followed by a big event, if that question makes sense. Um, the bigger... So I will answer the first question. I, I don't I don't remember the exact numbers for the ratio, but uh, we have significantly more asymptotics than for in this case. I think it's a factor of somewhere between ten and a hundred. Um, but I don't know if this is a general result. Um, so I, I want to run more simulations in, and also look at this in in three D. Um, so. It seems to be there seems to be a prevalence of a size mixed slip, but I don't know how general this is. But don't um, we observe more uh, foreshocks than we do pre-slip? I mean, when we look carefully. Right. So yeah. yeah. So uh, another question that I that I had a look at was how much pre-slip would you expect to see in places where you've seen foreshocks? And again, this is not trivial to estimate, but um, you can do back of the envelope calculation in which you are taking the foreshock area and saying, okay, that's that's where a seismic slip is also happening, which of course is a lower bound because you could have uh, foreshocks on a subset of the overall creeping region. But let's assume that it's the same. And then I can use the result that I derived for the acceleration and then ask if I have a region with a seismic slip of this size and it accelerates with this one over t um, function, what is the total moment released? And then I can compare, I, then I can ask for a place where we've seen four shocks, if there was a seismic slip of this moment, would we see it? And the answer was typically no. So I found that in, in many cases, the moment release would be maybe under magnitude five. And, um, and I don't think the geodetic capabilities like exist in those places to um, to detect that. So at the moment, I think um, my results are not inconsistent with the lack of observation of a seismic slip in places where we saw foreshocks, because I predict that it would be the, the, the a seismic slip would be too small to be to be seen. Um, Chris, did we say we'd stop the recording in the question session?
Yeah, thanks yeah, for the reminder, Ben and Green. And while you're on meeting, why don't you go ahead and uh, ask next, then we'll take Valerie before we go to Paul Johnson. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Camilla.